So I've been thinking about what we can learn from the names that are in the Gospels. Naming trends can vary dramatically depending on the time and place. Uh, for example, in 1900, almost no one was named Wendy. Then a little play named Peter Pan came out in 1904, in which the lead female character was named Immora Angela Dawn. Wendy's enough. And the popularity of the name skyrocketed, peaking in 1967 as the 32nd most popular name in the US. So if you're reading something that was actually written in 1903, uh, it's very unlikely that you'd find someone named Wendy in it, much less two or three Wendy's, despite the fact that the name was incredibly popular just 50 years later. The same kind of thing happened with uh, the name Luke after Star Wars and Luna after Harry Potter. In the same way, in the first century Palestine, there were names that were used and then there were names that weren't. Uh, there probably weren't a lot of Northwests running around, for example. Someone way smarter than me figured out that we might be able to gain some insights into the reliability of the New Testament by comparing the names we find there to the names that we know were in use in the general population at the time. Basically, the thinking goes that if the names were added later, or if the stories themselves developed later for that matter, it is highly unlikely that the names in the Gospels and Acts would reflect uh, the names in the general population in the time and place where these events allegedly happened. A few years ago, an Israeli scholar named Tali Lon published a database called the Lexicon of Jewish Names in Late Antiquity, or Lajna Law for short. I'm just kidding, no one calls it that yet. Hashtag Lajna Law. It draws on everything from formal writings like the New Testament, Josephus, and early rabbinic sources to things like legal documents, inscriptions, and ossuaries to compile a list of about 3,000 people from the time and their names. Here are the most popular names from the period with a couple names grouped up the same way we'd consider William and Bill to be the same name today. It's interesting to see that just like the name Wendy was popularized by Peter Pan, we can make good guesses about why these particular names were popular. Six of the nine most popular names were from the Hasmonean family who won Israel's independence in the second century BC and were the last rulers of an independent Jewish state before the Romans. You can actually read about the Hasmoneans in first and second Maccabees if you are so inclined. So basically Jews living under Roman rule in the first century liked naming their sons after heroes who had thrown off the previous conquerors. Digging into the Lajna law, about 15% of men in Palestine during the period were named either Simon or Joseph, which I think is fascinating. Basically in a room of 20 people, there would be three people named Simon or Joseph. Not only that, but 41% of men had one of the nine most popular names. So there was very little name diversity in first century Palestine, period. About 8% of the men had names that we only have one surviving example of. They were the Northwests of the day. In the Gospels and Acts, 18% of men are named either Simon or Joseph. So again, a lot of Simons and Josephs. They were definitely the kids in the class who had to fight over who got to be called Joe and who had to go by their middle name, Josanthopus. 40% of men had one of the nine most popular names. So again, a huge amount of people we meet in the Gospels and Acts share variations of the nine most popular names. And about 4% of the names in the Gospels, we only see refer to one person, folks like Nicodemus, for example. By comparison, when we look at the most popular Jewish names in Egypt at the time, which is geographically really close to Palestine, we find a dramatically different list of the most popular names. Eleazar and Joseph appear on both lists, but in different places, and the rest of the names are completely different. I think it's also interesting that the Egyptians were less likely to use Hasmonean names, with Eleazar being the only one that made the list. So there's a striking similarity between the names in the Gospels and the general population, and a significant difference between those names and the Jewish names in Egypt. To roughly summarize Richard Bauckham, the aforementioned individual who thought to study this, uh, with this in mind, it becomes very unlikely that the names in the Gospels accumulated in the stories later. Outside Palestine, the appropriate names simply could not have been chosen, and even within Palestine, it would be very surprising if a random accumulation of names to this or to that story fit the actual pattern of names in the general population. It's obviously nice to have confidence that the names weren't being added willy-nilly to the Gospels and Acts years later. That last bit is my commentary, by the way. I don't think scholars use words like willy-nilly. It's of course possible that names could have been original to the Gospels while other parts of the stories were embellished over time. But interestingly, often these names appear in stories that you'd be most likely to expect to find embellishment in. For example, the man named Jairus, whose 12-year-old daughter was declared dead before Jesus brought her back to life, or Cleopas, who sees Jesus on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection. I'm not saying the presence of accurate names in the miracle stories prove they happened, but I do think that their presence there is at least interesting food for thought. Anyhow, that's just something I've been thinking about. Uh, I think we can all agree that the really big takeaway here is that for your next piece of historical fiction set in 1903, you shouldn't name your female characters Wendy. 
If you like the video, giving us a thumbs up helps us out and helps us know what you like. If you have any questions or thoughts on this video or anything else, I'd love to hear them in the comments below. To keep up with our videos as we release them, you can hit the subscribe button and the bell icon will notify you when they're up. As with most of these subjects, this is just me doing my best to distill a complex idea into short and digestible YouTube videos. There's a lot more to be said on the subject. Today's video is pretty much all from this much of uh, an excellent book by Richard Balcom called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. It's not exactly light summer reading, but I highly recommend it if you're interested in taking a deeper dive. You can find it linked in the description below. Uh, besides that, have a great day.